So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, September the 16th, and this is episode number 175 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. My name is Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. So I'm glad that you're here today. There's a lot going on out there, and this is a critical time of year where we can make a lot of mistakes that uh, mess us up, mess our bees up for the entire winter. We're going to go over that. And a lot of the questions that were submitted over the past week deal with kind of things that people run into at the end of the beekeeping year. So if you're brand new here, welcome. If you're returning and you knew I was going to be here, thank you for coming anyway. Please look down in the video description to see what topics we're going to cover today, line item by line item. This is also a podcast on Podbean and it's titled The Way to Be. So before we get started with today's questions, let's look at the weather conditions. So first thing this morning, 6.30 or so, it was 44 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 7 Celsius. And I bring that up because things change rapidly from early morning to mid-afternoon, which is what we have right now. It was also 98% relative humidity. So when bees are trying to dehydrate their honey in the hives, you go out in your bee yard right now and it sounds like people left the exhaust vents on for their dryers and things like that. Lots of air movement going on. That 98% relative humidity works against the bees. So then we fast forward to 1 p.m. and it was at 77 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 25 Celsius, and the relative humidity dropped to to 63%. So the rise in temperature change was 33 degrees and the fall in relative humidity was 35%. So now it makes it much easier for the bees to dehydrate their honey. The drier, the better when they're trying to dry out their honey. So you also go out there and you can smell a lot of the honey in the air. We get anywhere near the apiary and we just smell it everywhere. So that means uncapped honey, by the way. So it's not ready to harvest, so don't be jumping in there yet, but we're getting very close. When that smell starts to wane, all the bees are busy. All the bees are happy right now. If you looked at the opening sequences, very busy landing boards. Don't be tempted now to open up your entrance reducers because there seems to be a lot of traffic coming in and out because that is going to change in a very short period of time. And when that happens, the robbers come out because we see lots of wasps right now checking the back doors of all the hives. Sure, the numbers are too high for the wasps to get in, but when that changes, bees turn to robbing bees and the wasps start to get in when when it's really cold because bees can't get out and forage below 48, 49 degrees Fahrenheit. So those are times of opportunity for the wasps out there. They're going to try to rob. So don't open up those entrances too much. Uh, The other thing is, uh, it's the time of drone evictions. I was out there at sunrise today. That's right. And they look at the landing boards and what was on the landing boards. Even drones in their pupa states. Dead drones all over the bottom. And also, I picked up a drone that was white. It was pupa. So they uncapped it. They pulled it out and they tossed it before it even finished developing because the bees are calling it quits. They're not going to let them develop. They need the space right now because... They're filling every available cell with nectar and pollen and baby bees. So bee brood. They're getting rid of the dead weight, the drones. So I picked one of those little white pupa drones. It was in the purple eye stage. That's near the end of their development. And it buzzed in my hand. So that was unexpected. Thought it was dead. So anyway, you'll see some drone video playing in the background here as uh, I looked into the observation hives too to see what's going on. So the drone evictions, I noticed another kind of drone congregation area. Most people, when they think of drone congregation areas, they think of where the drones have flown off to, sometimes miles away, and your virgin queens go there to get mated. But now drone congregation areas are also occurring inside the hive up above the brood area. And by drone congregation area, I mean they stick all their heads together and they have circled themselves, kind of like musk ox, but in reverse. Because musk ox, they aim their heads out to defend the weaker ones in the middle. The drones are all sticking their heads together. And I sat and I watched them at length this morning. You know why they're clustering together like that in there? Other than they're doing absolutely nothing. There's lots of ventilation going on in the hive right now because they're trying to dry their honey down. And do you think the drones are contributing to fanning their wings to help dry the honey? Nope. They're just taking up space. They're clustered. They're trying to avoid these bees. And I can't tell 
what the bee's job is because it's not listed. It's not an undertaker bee because they're not dead. It's not a guard bee because it's happening inside the hive up above the uh, brood area. But there are bees seeking out the drones and they're wedging themselves into these clusters of drones and they're pushing them apart. And then they isolate the drones and they're not feeding them. Not only that, guess what the drones aren't trying to do? They're not trying to get food from the nurse bees, which is what they normally would be doing. They pester them with their front legs and they get those nurse bees to give it up, to give up some feed through trophallaxis. So it's not happening. They're not being fed at all. So they know they're being cut off. Now, who knows what they really know? There's a lot of instinct and behavior and adaptation going on inside of hives. We assign human traits to this. But these worker bees are wedging in there and they'll isolate out one, they'll cut out one drone, and then they start biting in. At first, it looks like, oh, they must be grooming that drone because it must be young and maybe it's got a varroa mite on it and they're looking to get that off. No, that changes when the posture of that worker turns into a little curl and her abdomen comes underneath and she's actually trying to sting the drone. And I got the sweet video sequence that went on for several minutes of a worker bee latched onto a drone that's trying to get away and she's stinging it over and over only to find out that I didn't hit the record button. So I saved you the brutality of it all. And so what eventually happens is the drones either leave on their own. They, they, I'm sure the worker bees would much rather the drones scoot out of the entrance and just abandon the hive. They're going to starve to death. And that's why this time of year, don't be alarmed when you're looking at the ground in front of your landing boards, in front of your beehives, and you find a bunch of dead drones. And also some people get alarmed when they see that they are in the pupa state, that they're white, that they're developing. Uh, and the bees have tossed those out too. Does that mean there's a disease in your hive? No, it means your bees are cleaning house. And if you'll notice, look at the head and look at the eyes. The eyes on the drones are bigger and they come together at the top of the head. And so it'll be evident once you've looked at a few of them that these are all drones. So the bees are just ditching them. And if they don't go, they get stung on their way out. Does that mean that the bee that stings the drone dies. No, she can sting over and over because the drone for some reason does not retain the stinger the way we do when they sting us in the arm or whatever. The bee, the bee sting has barbs on it. It digs into our epidermis and it rips out of the bee's abdomen and then the bee dies. That doesn't happen when they're stinging other insects. So they can sting these drones all day long. The drones I notice after getting a series of stings slow way down and they're basically immobile. And then they do have to be dragged out by the undertaker bees that are going to cast them out on the landing board. And I did get a video sequence of some trying to fly away with them. Drones are big and heavy. And this is why we don't see a bunch of worker bees, generally speaking, dead on the ground in front of the hive because the undertaker bees get a hold of them and they fly them out or they deposit them on the landing board and another bee picks up on them and flies them out and they deposit them somewhere else. Now you would think that a honeybee flying with a dead bee in its, in its feet would fly out and just release it and let it drop in the grass somewhere, but they don't. They bomb together to the ground. And that's because if you look at the way the bee's toes are shaped, they've got these little hooks, two little hooks like that. And when they hook them into whatever they're carrying or holding on to, they have to actually push them down and out to release. They can't it's not like we have wrist strength where we can release like that. They have to push and unhook. Very interesting stuff and a great opportunity to observe that for those of you who want to see the drones getting their comeuppance or whatever. They're thinning them out because they're a waste of resources this time of year. Update on nucleus number 15. For those of you who may just be joining us now, you don't know that we had a queen fly out with a swarm and the swarm turned around and came right back to one of my observation hives in my way to be academy building. And we couldn't find the queen. So the cluster returned, the colony retained its worker strength, but lost its queen. Later we found the queen on the ground and the bees had chewed her wings to the point that she could not fly. So I put her inside a nucleus hive and it was hive number 15 and we did get a good retinue of bees to support her. She's gone now. So that colony failed. It was worth a try. Nothing to lose by doing that, but colony number 15 did not make it, and that queen that was injured also did not make it. So now we jump right into the questions that have come from the viewers like you. So here we go. First one comes from Kate from Greenwood, Indiana. 
Hi Fred, can you explain where the guard bees post their guard inside a lands hive? Also, is it possible to attach a landing board to these hives? I've learned so much from your weekly Q&A. Thank you. Well, thanks for listening and for watching. And uh, yeah, you can put a landing board on any hive. There are some advantages and disadvantages. So I'll just go over this real quick. The lands hive, for those of you who have... Sorry about that. I just happen to have a lands model. This is what a lands hive looks like. Of course, it's miniature. This is just a model for training purposes, and it was made by a viewer. So thank you very much. If you look at the entrance here, it's flat. There's no landing board here. And uh, lots of people that have lands hives don't have landing boards. Now, this could be an advantage for areas where, for example, there are small hive beetles. Small hive beetles have a tough time hovering. They need to land and crawl in sometimes, or they land on the face of something, then they crawl in. Landing boards can actually facilitate small hive beetles getting into a hive, unless they have some secondary lip or some protrusion at the entrance that makes them walk around the outside instead of going straight in. So there could be an advantage to that. But I take a whole bunch of slow motion videos of the bees. And we look at uh, bees coming in, of course, and just like recently, there's pollen coming in at a very high rate. So when we get these cold nights, cold mornings, when the weather does come up, it sounds like a swarm every single day in the apiary because so many bees are going to work. Now, what happens is you'll see them coming, when they're coming back, they're loaded with pollen and nectar in a lot of cases, and it looks very quick. The activity that we're seeing on the entrances and the landing boards seems very efficient. And what's really going on though is, you'll see bees piggyback each other that are trying to get in through that entrance and they'll drop to the ground and then you'll see them come up and miss over and over again. And that's in perfect weather conditions. So when they're really heavy, if there's a landing board, instead of dropping all the way to the ground and having to come back, they end up on the landing board and then they're just kind of queued up and they can walk in. So the landing board definitely helps them. The other thing is sometimes we have windy conditions. So you'll see bees coming in heavy loaded, about 30% of their body weight added when they're fully loaded with nectar and pollen. And so they are really heavy and they're fatigued. We don't know how far away they've come from with that resource. So they come in and uh, a side wind can blow them away. So that's where these side blocks come in. And I thought it was kind of a beginning beekeeper genius when uh, I was looking at this behavior and I thought, why don't we have these side wind baffles that would block that? And then when they get in here, they're like fighting it and then they finally land and they're clear, they're out of that crosswind and then they can walk in. But you know what? Behind me, I have the A to Z of beekeeping, the A I root B library. And that, uh, that book is a hundred years old. And guess what's in it? Beehives with landing boards, with the uh, high visors, so the roof that extends over the entrance, and side baffles for wind. So see, we kind of, you know, we can think we're geniuses when really all we're doing is making the same observations that other people did 100 years ago. And they actually applied those to their hive designs and somewhere along the line we stopped doing that. And I know why we stopped doing it. And that's because, once again, the distinction between backyard beekeeping and commercial beekeeping. We're not pinching every penny and making maximum use of all available materials. Instead, we're putting a lot of add-ons to our hives that just seem right, that seem like they would work. Landing board would be one of those. Not essential. Helpful, though. The other thing is hive visors. They drop the temperature in front of that hive by 15 degrees in super hot midday sun during the summer. So a high visor, super handy. If I'm a commercial beekeeper, it's another piece of gear to track, so I don't need it, right? So the side baffles, again, cuts down on the wind, can help the bees, but doesn't. it's not a do or die addition to your hive design. So what's happened is through the years, commercial beekeeping has taken over everything and made hive designs extremely efficient and taking hive equipment down to the bare minimum. But thank goodness we're backyard beekeepers and when we find out or make observations that these little add-ons would help benefit the bees just a little bit, just improve their day the tiniest amount, we can do it. Because we don't need to strap all our hives together. We're not shipping them. We're not putting them on pallets. So we don't need all this efficiency of equipment 
and efficiency of movements. I don't know if you've ever been through a an efficiency review before. They bring a number cruncher in and they look at every step a person takes to complete a task. And if you're a commercial beekeeper, every, every step you take that's additional is more time, less money for the time, return on your investments lowered, blah, blah, yada, yada. So now, backyard beekeepers, we can add that. So yes, if you have a lands hive, especially if you're living in the north, I think uh, landing boards are fantastic. In the wintertime, snow can pile up on them too. So you have to be aware of that and scrape the snow off your landing boards. You don't have landing boards and your hive is nice and elevated. The higher your hive is off the ground, the better for the bees. That's why bees live in trees when they pick their own spots. But anyway, no landing board, no snow build up. No potential for the snow to pile up and block the entrance. So you don't have to get out there and clean it off. So you have to weigh the pros and cons of everything. And if you face your hive to the south and you get that winter summer sun, and that melts things off first from your landing board. So, and if you've got, I'm sorry if I'm talking too fast. If you've got a high visor, snow piles up on top of the high visor and reduces the amount of snow that lands on your landing board too. So all these things can work in concert with one another to improve your bees lives and daily routine. So the next part of the question is guard bees. Where do they post their guard bees? Guard bees are a fascinating group of little bees, by the way. Now we know that there are this time of year, about a thousand or more new bees every single day emerging from their cells. So we know that they go through a variety of jobs as they develop. And we talk about those, you know, they're housekeeping bees then they're nurse bees and some attend the queen. They become part of her retinue. But here's the thing. Not every bee does every job. Because think about it. If they all did the exact same jobs at the same stage of development in their lives, for example, there would be a day where the queen's retinue would compose over a thousand bees. Well, that's a waste of energy. That's a waste of bees. So some skip these jobs and go on to other jobs. I also think that some bees are kind of born cranky. And those are the ones that become guard bees. And they're a little older and they're transitioning to becoming foragers. But uh, not every bee again becomes a guard bee because there again, we'd have thousands of bees dedicated to nothing but guard duty. So they can pull double duty. Guard bees also fan the entrance. Why? Because the entrance is where they're focused because that's where the defenses have to occur. So even on a Lands Hive or a Langstroth Hive, vertical, horizontal, wherever the entrance is, outside of that entrance, weather permitting, you'll see guard bees on the landing board. They're trying to check the incoming bees before they get a chance to go in. These are also the ones that engage and start stinging and biting yellow jackets when they land on the landing boards. And that is going on right now. I tried to get video sequences, but they're happening really fast. In fact, the guard bees, you'll see them, their mandibles will be open. Every time they go for something, they're ready to bite. And their heads are up and their forelimbs are up and they're ready to go. Sometimes they'll fly right off the landing board. Why? Because they saw somebody walking 20 feet away and that's the one bee that comes after you and bounces off your forehead or bounces off of your veil. That bounce, you think, oh, it's trying to fly through. It just couldn't avoid me and hit me in the head. Or you just get headbutted and warned by a guard bee. Not only that, that guard bee's frequency of the wing beat is elevated. So when a guard bee comes, you're hearing all the bees zinging through and you hear, you know, kind of the harmonics of their wing beats about 200 to 250 beats per second on average. And you hear one ramp up and then that's the one that pauses near you and starts looking at contrast areas on your bee suit, guard bee. So there will be one or two that just are angry all the time. I think those bees are born. So it's also why we don't see thousands of them unless the genetics are ultra defensive, then you have a, everybody is kind of a guard bee. If it's an Africanized colony, almost every worker in that colony can convert to being a guard bee and start attacking and things like that. But guard bees in general, they're on the landing board, they're at the entrance and they're just inside the entrance. They're also on the periphery of brood frames and things like that. But that's also why when you get to the field of bees on your brood frames, when you're trying to inspect and stuff and you can move them around with your fingers and you don't see those bees because those are nurse bees. You don't see them staring straight at you or opening their mandibles in a threat stance. They're just kind of scooting out of the way. They're trying to feed and clean and take care of larvae 
and you're preventing them from doing that, and so, but they don't sting. The ones out on the edge, the ones up at the top, if you've got a second entrance or a vent up there, you'll find guard bees there too. And so you can tell them right away. They're the ones that are looking right at you and their heads are kind of teetering. And, and when you move over here, their, their face follows you. You move over here and they still stare at you. And that's a couple of puffs of smoke will send them away. So bees that are staring at you are likely guard bees, but most of them are at the entrance, regardless of the hive you have. The other thing is in observation hives, um, we try different lighting. So red light, blue lights, different light spectrums. And it's the guard bees, we make this assumption, that wherever there's a light spot, wherever there's a breach in the hive, that would emit light into it. Because that's all they think is happening when you sign a pen light into your hive. Those are the guard bees that rush to that spot. So if there were a breach in the hive and there's light, guard bees rush to that location. So when you're doing your inspections and you're pulling things apart, uh, guard bees would come because you're also letting light in. So... They also go and start, so they're mobile too, but they're stationed, to answer the question, at the entrances. Do, 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 do. So moving on to question number two. Comes from David from Amarillo, Texas. A month ago you said something that's been percolating in my mind ever since. You said you had some Formic Pro strips on the shelf. I do have boxes of it. And now my question is, do people realize what the expiration dates on Formic Pro really mean? Here's my cautionary tale. I too had some Formic Pro sitting on a shelf. This past spring, I checked the expiration date and saw it was only a month away, figuring it was safe to use the strips. They hadn't actually been expired yet, he says. I went ahead and put the two strips on each of my nine hives. To my dismay, thousands of dead bees greeted me the next morning, including four queens. So didn't just lose workers, lost queens. I went to the NOD website and read the specs of Formic Pro, only to discover that Formic Acid itself doesn't expire. What expires is the ability of the paper wrapper to slowly release the Formic Acid into the hive. So the past expiration date we risk killing bees with too sudden dose of excessive formic acid. I hope your other viewers know this. So that's worth saying. I want to thank David for that. Because if we have a potential issue with any treatment, and for those who don't understand, formic pro, formic acid, is uh, something that is used to take out varroa destructor mites. And it does it by putting these little packets on top of your brood area. And you can do it in a double dose for 10 days, or you can do it in a single dose, one after the other, extend it out to 20 days on the brood. And it is temperature sensitive, and there are a lot of guidelines that go with it. The new formula has a two year shelf life, and mine is coming up on the end of the two year shelf life, and I haven't used it. I kept it in reserve in case I had a real mite bomb going on, and then I was going to hit it with the double packs for 10 days. Uh, the other thing is there's a temperature limitation on it, and I'm not going to quote the temperature right now because as this video gets watched months or years down the road, the formula and the labeling may change. Right now it's in the 80s, but I always want you to go by whatever the labeling on the treatment that you have says to do. As far as dose, time it's on, and then the expiration date, temperature parameters, and things like that. Formic Pro is really effective. It works right through the uh, pupae, and so right through the caps, and uh, it's safe with right now. So again, follow the label and follow the guidelines, but it's safe with your honey supers on. But most people don't want to lift a bunch of honey supers off just to put Formic Pro on there. But uh, we do need to be aware when it's expired, what does that mean and what's the potential risk? When you put Formic Pro on a colony of bees, it is supposed to be a strong colony, by the way. You also are supposed to open up all your entrances full bore. So they need to be able to ventilate during this period of treatment. If it gets really hot, you can expect a huge die off and there is a risk to the queen and everything else. And that's why some people don't care. And uh, what I mean by that is some people order in a bunch of queens. They know that uh, either it's gonna be hot or you know it's gonna be detrimental to the reproduction of their queens. So what they'll do is Go ahead and treat and requeen each of those colonies following the treatment because the night the mite die off is so effective. 
So this will be good if I can find that link if those of you or if David is watching this and you have the link to, of course, the website that describes these limitations, uh, because that's what you rely on. These packets are designed so that they release this formic acid at a controlled rate because number one, we want it to last a full 10 days. The biggest die off that occurs for the row destructor mites when you put these packets in is in the first 72 hours. So it needs to release over time if it releases too fast. The other thing is some people are saying, well, once the treatment date's over, I just leave mine in there. Please don't because now you have a sublethal dose in there for the varroa mite and we're extending that out and there's always, with any treatment, the risk of some adaptation by the varroa destructor mites to the point where they no longer respond and die from formic pro, from formic acid. So it's one of our good tools right now, and it has no residue, so that's the other positive bonus for it, which is why I have it on the shelf. And I have to say I've never had to use it because I've gotten the results I needed from oxalic acid vaporization. So this is a very good cautionary statement. I hope you'll look it up for those who are interested, especially if you're planning to use it. If you have it on the shelf, check your expiration dates. It makes perfect sense to me. So always follow labeling and never use expired treatments. Question number three comes from Shauna in South Dakota. Can you talk about wintering nukes? To give them the best chance of survival, how strong or how many frames of bees should you have? Is a double five frame the best configuration and what should they weigh? In my area, I think they suggest a double deep should be 90 pounds. Thank you. Okay, so for Shauna, first of all, uh, a double deep nucleus box that only has 10 deep frames in it. So if every one of those frames was chock-a-block with honey and nothing else and capped, we're talking about an average of seven pounds per deep Langstroth frame, and that's the plastic ones, because the plastic full frames actually hold the most because that plastic trim, the plastic trim does not take up as many cells. So if that's a deep frame, see how thin this plastic back is? That means there's more cells available when you use a one piece plastic than if we have the wooden frames. Now. They've, you know, because I weigh them. I actually have a scale this year and I'm weighing individual frames that are full of honey because I've always heard the numbers and they average from six and a half to seven pounds each. So times 10, we're at 60 or 70 pounds. So even if we're chock a block, you can't get 90 pounds in there. So we'll dismiss that part. But how much do you really need? And so this is the kind of nuke I'm talking about. It was in the cover shot today. This is a wooden Langstroth 10 or five frame deep nucleus hive. It comes with two options. Some of them have the standard bottom board, which is another piece that you have to worry about. And uh, they also have the standard landing board with an entrance reducer on it. Those are not my favorite. Both of these that are my favorites come from Better B. And guess what? Last time I checked, they were out of stock. So I have stocked up on these. Why does it have this dark color? Because I use eco wood to finish all of my pine these days. So anyway, they come with everything you see here except this brass tag. These brass tags are actually valve tags that I buy and uh, use them as uh, hive numbering pieces of gear. And the wheels come with them. And the wheels, I'm just going to go over this while we're here. You have wide open, which I never use. <laughs> You have wide open, you have screen just for venting. So for example, if you're using this to transport a swarm that you just collected, closed off right there and they're vented. There's also a queen excluder here. And then, so if you got your queen in there and you wanna make sure that she can't abscond, I never use this either, but that's what it's for. It keeps the queen in, workers can come and go. Drones cannot come and go. Then you come over here, what's this big excluder right here? This is a bumblebee excluder of all things. So if that's on there, your queen could still come and go, but bumblebees, the big ones, can't get in or out. Here's how I use it. I keep it right here regardless of how many bees are in here, especially this time of year. I cover this hole halfway. That's it. I never open it all the way. So no matter how many stacks up here I do, I keep them halfway. So these are my resource hives. And then you can get the ones without the bottoms that are just the supers that are also five frame deeps. 
How many do I use? Right now, my biggest ones have three on them. And I can tell you that the top two boxes, at least two out of five of those second story frames are capped honey. The top box, nothing but capped honey. That is more than enough for this colony to get through winter. So the other thing is how do I use it? I start off with a single box. I put the five frames in there as they fill four out of five frames and they've got the brood and pollen's in there and the, the honey's being stored, I add the second box. And as soon as they build that out, so as a resource hive, I also use these little nucleus boxes uh, to get my bees to draw a comb and make more comb because they build so fast. Total, we would have 15 deep frames in my current configuration, which is three boxes, but that's only after they've expanded in number, built their resources, and filled, so I don't expand all at once. Keeping it as a single five-frame nuke to start off with, they will build the fastest, they control their environment the best, and uh, then you can just expand as you go. So for wintering, by the way, I don't feed them, but some people could or want to. These are called migratory covers. So this is what you'll see on a lot of commercial hives. And these are what come with, you can get them with the telescoping cover, but for all my nucleus hives, I use this uh, migratory cover. And this would allow you to put all of your nucleus boxes directly side by side, right up against each other. And uh, I don't do more than groups of four. And that's because if you go beyond four, there seems to be much more drift. And by that, I mean, Bees that are trying to come to the center box end up sometimes just landing and going into the end boxes. So the ends tend to get more population. So if you can separate them, that's pretty good. Uh, and there's a hole in the top here. And that's because I initially did drill a hole in it because I thought I wanted to make sure that they were fed. And I learned that they didn't need to do that because of where I live. Anyway. This is a Be Smart one gallon hive top feeder. That little spud goes right over that hole. I can line it up. And you're gonna feed your bees through that hole for those of you who want to feed it. I like this hole isn't even big enough for it. But if, it, oh yeah, I know what I did. I used a silicone ring underneath of this and sealed off that circle around there and then it sat flush on top of here. And then uh, this is exposed to the weather that way though. This is out there and I only did that for the first one. They built up too fast, decided I didn't need this. But I explained it for those of you who might because you might live in the desert somewhere. I don't know where you are. There might not be resources for your bees. But um, I took them off and then for the winter time, I do insulate that cover because these migratory covers don't have room for insulation. There's no room for putting fondant underneath of them. They are a very utility base. And if you look at uh, University of Guelph, for example, they use those and they put um, cotton duck canvas on, then they put the migratory cover on top of that and then the bees propolize the canvas and then they peel that back. So that becomes kind of an inner cover beneath the outer cover. I don't do it because they've demonstrated that I don't need to do that for them. So then the other thing is I have these polystyrene caps for it. They're two inches thick everywhere. So that's an R10. They sit right on top of the migratory cover and they extend down several inches around the circumference, top only, so that's insulated. And I put those on last year. Every one of them came through winter. So they came through winter with about 35 pounds of honey, and they had honey left over. Not only that, my uh, nucleus colonies and uh, my nucleus colonies were flying on warm days in winter. So I never had to guess, are they alive or dead in there? Uh, so they actually, that little heat capsule that we form at the top by putting that R10 rigid foam board cover, I probably should make a video on how to do that because there are some tips and tricks when you're using it's that Pink Panther rigid two inch foam board. And if you make a cap with it, the best glue for that, are you ready, is expansion foam. So if you use great stuff expansion foam and you just squirt a little bead of that on the edges and then you rub them back and forth together and press them up and it's important that you clamp them just like you're doing woodwork, 
then when that rigid foam, when that expansion foam expands and fills all the gaps in there, it is as strong as the foam board itself and turns it into a single piece, even though it's actually five pieces, the top and four sides. And then you can just paint that with an exterior paint. A friend of mine did them for me and wrapped them in duct tape. So I'd like to get away from the duct tape and I want to glue them up, make them airtight with Great Stuff Expansion Foam. And then I learned about that, by the way, from Foam Sculptors, which was really interesting, interesting group of people. And these are foam sculptures that go outdoors. So waterworks and things like that. So it was really interesting to me that Expansion Foam is the best adhesion for foam board. So anyway, that's what I do for those. And I'm going to put those insulated foam caps on top of every nucleus hive I have, even at the very beginning when it's just one box. And that protects them from a lot of heat in the summertime, and of course helps them create that heat capsule inside that hive in the wintertime. And Michael Palmer has included his nucleus, he may even go taller than threes. Uh, they look very unstable, but you strap them all together with shipping straps, and even if a huge wind came and was able to knock it down, they stay together, and again, the ones that I use don't have a bottom board. We had a huge windstorm come through here, and uh, while it was raining, we lost trees, lots of trees. They fell down in rows, one right after the other, so it was almost like a micro cyclone that came through here. And while that was going on, I was putting them on, bee, on my bee suit so that the minute the winds died down and the rains were coming, I ran out and was able to just tip these hives right side up again. And the ones with shipping straps on them, which is most of them, uh, I was able to just stand them up and get them right back uh, on their stands. So strapping things down, very easy with that. And the insulated covers, winter storms are coming. So, you know, we can worry about it or we can have them ready to go. But that's my configuration. One uh, level at a time, based on how they fill them up, and two or more will make it through winter because it's size for the colony that's occupying it, and keep that entrance at half a half moon right there. No reason to open it farther, and I've demonstrated that through the last 12 months, and I'm sure I have the same expectation this year that they'll do the same. Question number four, moving on. This comes from Eileen, Stony Point, New York. Hi Fred, for your winter configuration of one deep and one medium super, do you do anything in the spring to keep the queen from laying in the medium? So that is my standard uh, hive configuration going into winter, a single deep, and it doesn't matter if it's an eight frame or a 10 frame Langstroth deep. Single deep with a medium super on it. And this is how I start my spring too, by the way a deep and a medium, and I let them fill that up before we advance and start supering that hive. So, with the deep and the medium in the spring, they'll be at the top of the medium and they'll be up underneath that insulated inner cover, which is another critical part of my configurations going forward. Insulated inner cover, insulated feeder shim, insulated outer cover. And the sidewalls below that are just three quarter inch pine and they're making it great with that configuration. So uh, they do have brood up there and I just let them, let them go because in the spring they'll be brooding up first in that top medium and then they'll start backfilling and as the temperature warms up they migrate on down and start using the old comb that's already there from the previous year. So they'll be using the comb and they'll start building their brood out towards the entrance again as things warm up and then they'll be back filling with honey and that becomes, that medium box becomes the honey bridge that I use when we're adding another super because I don't use queen excluders. So no, I don't do anything to it. I leave it right there and I do my inspections and I watch them migrate back down. Now somebody may ask, what if they never migrate down? I've actually never had that happen. So I don't know what happens if they never migrate down. Uh, I guess I leave them there until they fill the space and keep uh, doing brood and migrating their brood down lower. I don't use upper entrances or upper venting. That's one of the reasons that they might be incentivized to stay near the top in a medium super in spring, if there's a top vent or if there's an airflow up there, then they could keep their brood up near that and ventilate the brood because that is kind of their key to what they're going to circulate air through 
and where they want the convenience. That's why they migrate down and keep their brood closer to the entrances. So that may be another reason why my bees are migrating down into the lower box in spring, probably quicker than those who have uh, an upper entrance or an upper vent on their hive. So I don't do either of those two. Question number five comes from Trish, Somerset, South Dakota. I have a swarm that's caught from an original hive. They have not filled all 10 frames of brood and they've not filled the box yet. I'm planning to make a candy board feeding shim filled with sugar with very little water so it hardens into a thick solid. So some people call that a sugar brick. You mentioned the Hive Alive fondant. Would you put the Hive Alive fondant below the feeder shim directly on frames or on top of the candy board feeding shim? We have really cold winters and I'm hoping to have enough resources for this single brood box to make it through winter. Thanks for all your videos. Okay, so here's the thing. This is what I would do. No, I don't put it, here's why I don't put it underneath the inner cover. I know I show this often and the reason I show it often is because it works. This is the Be Smart insulated inner cover. Any insulated inner cover will likely do the same thing. This one happens to be encapsulated in plastic so your bees cannot chew it. If you have just rigid foam board insulation as your inner cover, the bees are going to chew holes through it. You don't want that. So anyway, what goes on with this inner cover is, so this insulated inner cover is on every single one of my Langstroth boxes. This is the hole that the bees will go up through to get to either of the two things mentioned here. There could be a candy board on top of here, but there the entrance, this is the hole that accesses that candy board. So I don't use candy boards, but if you had to wrap it around, that would sit here too. They would go up through the hole into this rapid round and access dry sugar in there, which according to this description, they're gonna add water to make it solidify. Here's a little keynote about dry sugar and adding water to it. If you're using it as an emergency ration in winter, you don't need to. You can pour your sugar up in your rapid round. If you've got some kind of feeder shim that allows you to pour sugar in there, you can just pour it there, but the rapid round makes spring cleanup easier. And that's because condensation inside the hive that's going to form there, that humidity is going to build up in the sugar and turn it into a sugar brick anyway. So you really don't need to add it. But uh, where would I put the fondant? Would I put it underneath here on the frames? No, I wouldn't because during winter, I don't want to take this off at all. Why? Because in the winter time, these edges are going to be sealed with propolis by the bees and they're going to do that in October for me. That's why once the weather gets really cold, let me pause. Once the weather gets really cold, I don't reconfigure anything. Because the bees will have already sealed with propolis all these edges. So if I have to pry this up, and they have these built-in pry points and everything. If I have to pry that up so I can check fondant, I just destroy the propolis seal. That is a big deal. Because now there's a leak path of air through here. And air leaking through is more critical than all the insulation in the world because an air leak is a loss of heat from inside this capsule here. So I don't want to do that. Everything I want to do is up here. And the way I put these together is I have a feeder shim. It's either a shallow or a medium 10 frame box. And if you have an eight frame hive and this is sitting on the eight frame hive, your feeder shim is still going to be a 10 frame. So then when I put that up here, I have insulation all around the inside walls of that also. And then I would put my fondant pack. Let's say I had one handy right on here with a hole cut in the middle on this side, just larger than this hole right here. Put this on here and my bees can get up in here. Now when I pull my insulated outer cover off and I look in here, I can see how much of the fondant is left I can see how much they've consumed. And this year I'm changing it up. So last year I had the insulated inner covers on, worked great, staying with them. This year, now there was an airspace in here, so it's three inches or more of airspace, regardless of what kind of box you put around it. 
Then I had the BMAX insulated cover on top of that, so I had all this open air up here. This year, I'm not going to have that. I am going to have those components, but I'm adding Reflect Tex double bubble insulation. So I'm going to cut a sheet of that. You can cut two or three if you want to. And I'm just going to push those down in here. If you look up Reflect Tex double bubble, you'll see what I'm talking about. Make sure it's a little larger than the space, so when you put it in, you have to kind of bend it over because it traps air between each layer and that creates more insulation for them to feed up in here. And then we still have the BMAX outside. So this year I'm adding insulation to the existing configuration. B-Smart Designs insulated inner cover, insulated sidewalls, BMAX outer cover, and then in between in this fluff area here, I'm going to have those layers of double bubble. You buy it by the roll. Cuts easy. I don't know why I never used it before. Yes, I do, because I just learned about it this year. If I had known sooner, I'd be using it sooner. It has that aluminum facing on both sides. Air does not pass through it. It can't get waterlogged. It can't take on condensation. It can't be defeated. If you put fiberglass insulation up there, create like some kind of quilt box, condensation can build up in that and it can defeat its thermal properties. Reflect text, double bubble. Doo, 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 doo. So that's Hive Alive. If you want to know what that is, by the way, that was the other thing I had on all my hives last year. Well, no, I split it 50 50. I had sugar and rapid rounds, and then I had Hive Alive on 50% of my colonies in winter last year. Now, some made it with sugar, and some made it with Hive Alive. So, what was the big Big difference. What's the big whoop about it? Well, the ones with Hive Alive had uh, more brood in them, and this is a one off for me. So that's one winter with Hive Alive. Why? Because we didn't have it the winter before that. So this is made by the same people that make the Hive Alive liquid that you add to your late season syrup. Some people are going to go to two to one to try to get their bees to build resources and store more resources going into wintertime. And this is after your honey supers are off. If you use Hive Alive syrup on that, which is like, I'm not going to say the dose because I don't know it right off the top of my head. It's like two teaspoons or two tablespoons per gallon. And one gallon is the dose for the whole hive. And what does that do? Knocks down nozema spores in the mid gut of the bees, which becomes a problem in spring. So Hive Alive Fun it was my choice for last year. I already have cases of it for this year and I'm putting it on all my hives. I'm going to put it on my, the only hive that will not have it will be the Layens hive. And that's because the Layens hive configuration is not set up so I can feed them fondant. There's no place to put it. I would have to either spread frames apart and create a feeding gap or I would have to make a hole somewhere. Um, but I'm trying to follow with Dr. Leo's recommendations on that as much as I can, even though it's hard for me to follow that when there are other things I would like to be doing. But uh, I'm leaving it. And by the way, the Lance hides are working great. I have two of them. We did a split because the one was super populated. Those are doing extremely well. So, too many moving parts in the answer to this question. But I hope that makes sense on how I'm configuring things for winter time. And I do not put fondant, pollen patties, winter patties, anything like that underneath my inner cover that would require me to pry it off, break that credit, you know, that really, really important propolis seal. I don't want to break that and, and create a gap that my bees cannot repair. So warmer climates, you could probably do it. Can't do it up here. Well, you could, it's just going to expect a bunch of condensation at the edges where you created that air leak because now the dew point will be achieved there and you'll have uh, a loss of heat from your bees and you'll also have uh, condensation right there. So the next question, number six, comes from Joe from St. Petersburg, Florida. First part of the question is kind of funny here. It says, do you still keep your rodents and are they for you or are they for your grandkids? So for those of you who may have checked out my YouTube channel, some of my most viewed videos deal with uh, hamster cages, have a trail, and critter trail and we had gerbils and uh, robo hamsters which are the world's smallest hamsters and the world's fastest um so roboski or something like that anyway i created villages for them so that's probably where this question comes from 
who owns them? Well, actually, we had the robo hamsters, my wife and I did, in our living room for the longest time, a whole village. So it was every, I think those were the habit trails. And so we connected all the habit trails together. And uh, it was very interesting. And then we actually donated those to a family that came over and was looking at them. And the kids were so excited to see the hamsters and learn about them. And the kids seemed like they were really responsible acting. And they really wanted these tiny hamsters. What kid doesn't in the moment that they're looking at a tiny fuzzy pet like that? Um, they wanted to keep them. So what I did is we donated the entire village to them. The mom was super happy that she was taking home something that took up like four feet by eight feet. Uh, and then the others were gerbils. I gave those to my niece and nephew. They appeared in the videos where we were reviewing them because I was reviewing uh, habitats for Critter Trail and Habit Trail. So we don't have them here anymore. I donated them, gave them away to kids that would get more out of it. So going on, it says, so I have a horizontal Langstroth a little over a year. Caught a swarm for it. Unknown age of the queen, of course. So far, not impressed with the growth of the hive. It has had six productive frames all year. Well, she disappeared last week. So I think they mean the queen disappeared. Joined a small nuke with them, having a bee weaver queen. Hopefully, she wants to grow the hive bigger in the spring. So is thinking, I know you have horizontal hives. Seems many people have problems with the cluster not moving during winter weather and some colonies dying. What are your thoughts on a horizontal hive built to six to eight inches longer? That would allow three frames across. Bees seem to do quite well in floor joists and so on. Okay, so here's the key, I think. The Lands Hive, first of all, let's talk about that. So I have Lands and Long Langstroth. And uh, right now their populations are equal. So I can't see an advantage to one over the other. The Langstroth uses all Langstroth deep frames. One advantage in wintertime would be that I could put emergency feed over the Langstroth because I have four inch cover boards that go down the line. And by the way, for those who are listening and watching right now, I'm going to put a link down in the video description associated with question number six that will show the Langstroth design that we came up with. Uh, so I, I did the designing and the testing and uh, Ross Millard drew up the prints for me. So those are available to you for free, those of you who want to build those hives. But anyway, the Long Langstroth uh, has the advantage that we can put fondant in there if you wanted to. And I did last year, they didn't use it. And uh, the four inch boards that are the cover boards, two of those have feeder holes in them. So wherever the cluster happens to be, anywhere in the line, because my hives are big, they're five feet long. Um, so wherever that cluster is, I can place that four inch board that has the feeder hole directly over the cluster and then put, if you want to wrap it around, you can put that on there. Or if you want to do the fondant, you can, of course, put the fondant straight over that. And that's what I did last year. And I always put it labeled down and I cut my hole in the label so that I can see through this side. And only one hive the bees cleaned every single micro inch of this. There was no colony that used 100% of it. I had no colony with this on it that died out in the winter. That was queen right. So it's a huge advantage. That's why I'm sticking with it. But so for the long Langstroth, that had the advantage of feeding them. And uh, so what am I changing this year? Here's what I noticed about both of those hive designs. The hive that comes from Leo Sharashkin, the horizontalhive.com is the website. I bought his premium hives. I wanted the best one that he makes. And that's because if I'm going to test it, I, I don't want there to be any discussion about, well, you could have got the better one. So I got the best ones that he makes. They're insulated with sheep's wool. Um, they're very well made. The covers have the metal cladding over the top. And what do you think I'm gonna say about that? When it comes to the edges of when you put that lid on, and I had to insulate them myself. They, he recommends that you make one of these quilts that you put in there That's you can get them full of uh, wool again. What do you think I'm putting in mine? Yep, this new Reflectex, it's not new. I say it's new, it's new to me. Reflectex double bubble, I'm gonna use that as my pillow, multiple layers of it with the airspace in between. That stuff is only an R1.1 by itself, individually. 
But when you add an air gap and then another layer of Reflectex double bubble, and I believe it's a two and a half inch air gap or a three inch air gap, it becomes an R13, which is better than two inch rigid insulation foam. So I'm going to create my pillows out of Reflectex. It can't take on moisture. It can't have its insulation properties defeated. So the other part of that is it's really thin. When you open up these lids, horizontal hives like the long lang, when you're lifting it up, and mine looks like a coffin, I know, it's, it looks bad, it looks like it's there to kill bees. Uh, when you bring them down together, mine is made out of two by stock, so it's inch and a half, inch and a half thick pine. And when the cover comes down, they meet together, and you can put a little weather strip in there if you want to, but this year I'm not having that little weather strip in there. Instead, I'm going to have a piece of Reflectex that extends across the top of all my cover boards and extends to the outer edge of this mating surface where the top comes together with the bottom. Because what is that going to do? It's going to absolutely defeat any airflow through there and create a thermal capsule up above, an insulated cover. It already has R10 up there, but there's a big air gap and now I can have on the cover boards Reflectex. What do you think about that? And the Reflectex will go through the joint and it'll come down when I clamp it down. It's adaptable because it's, it's really bubble wrap kind of, and it's got aluminized surfaces on both of, on top and bottom. And so when I clamp that down, it'll compress, but it'll fill any gaps and irregularities and there won't be any air movement through there. So this winter, the reason I bring that up as I think that one of the things that hinders our bees' ability in these configurations, these horizontal configurations, is the fact that inside it's just too cold. So what they've done is, and the numbers are too small. And the reason I make that comparison is because when we have brood over here, and they always have some brood in winter, our most brood-free time frame here in the state of Pennsylvania, northeastern United States, usually is right around the end of November and the beginning of December. How do we know that the brood is the smallest then? Just by thermals alone, because that's when the colony, the cluster is the coolest, because they're just keeping themselves alive. They're not warming brood, because brood, on the brood cells themselves, it has to be 94 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a heat signature that we can pick up with thermals. So, when we get to that point, we get to treat them with oxalic acid vaporization to knock out any residual mites. And by the way, that treatment, a single treatment, it's not a series. A single treatment of oxalic acid vaporization at the end of November, the beginning of December, because most of the mites are phoretic, which means they're exposed. There's tiny brood present, which means that they can't hide underneath the caps. So any residual mites get knocked out, up to 96% of them based on studies from mite counters. So that single treatment can head you into spring with a very tiny mite load that they almost never recover from if you've also got hygienic varroa resistant bees, which I do. So, and uh, that gets watered down, of course, with every swarm, with every new queen, with every new mating that we don't know what they did, but we can start with that stock and we know the history because we're counting mites. But anyway, if you have enough bees, they will stay over that cluster where the brood is, and the rest of them, if it's warm enough inside the space, they can get over and access the feed and migrate those resources back to the cluster. So there's this outer mantle of bees, and those are the oldest bees, and they have to, if we did a time lapse of it, it would look like it's boiling a little bit because new bees would be coming through and taking over that outer shell, and the others would be migrating to the middle. And they're also bringing water and condensation. That's why condensation inside the hive is actually valuable to the bees on the side walls. It's detrimental to the bees directly over on the inner cover. That's why an insulated inner cover takes away the dew point directly over the cluster of bees and instead moves that dew point down below the cluster on the side walls. And they go out there and collect the water that is condensed there and they migrate that in because the nurse bees that are in the middle that are taking care of your brood, they have those resources brought to them. And the same is true of honey stores that you have in the hive. By the way, your bees cannot just consume the honey. They need water to do it. Honey is actually too dense on its own. So for all that sugar to be metabolized, they rely on this condensation. That's why 
When people start thinking, I'm going to get every bit of condensation out of my beehive, I don't want them to be exposed to condensation at all. I want you to rethink that just like humans. You know, when it's really, really cold outside, if you're in some kind of survival training, your winter survival is improved if you're properly hydrated. So the same for the bees. Their winter survival depends on their access to moisture and carbohydrates. So this is all important to have available to them. And if we insulate the top, so this year I'm going to add the Reflectex on there. So I'm increasing that. And I have the largest populations in my horizontal hives that I have ever had in the past. If they can't survive this winter, I don't know what it takes to get a horizontal hive through winter. So we're going to see. Spring will tell the tale. But uh, I'm just letting you know that this is what I'm doing. I'm also letting you know that part about we don't want to completely dehydrate a hive. We want some condensation in there. It's just where we want it to be. And when I look at observation hives, I can see where the condensation forms and where the cluster is, and we can clearly see where the thermal changes are because we're just taking shots through a piece of plexiglass when it's open. So we're also gonna learn a lot from the, there are three observation hives in my way to be academy building this year. We're gonna learn a lot about wintering because that is not a heated building. And they're in triples, so they can insulate themselves, and bees insulate themselves with bees. And then there's a secondary barrier. So we've got the bee cluster, which is where all the heating is taking place, and that's what they're trying to keep warm so they can survive. But you see, they have secondary heat. So they're respirating and their bodies are generating heat just because they're alive. And that heat rises inside the hive and then goes down the outside walls and begins to cool. And that's when the condensation occurs. So the secondary heating is what we're hoping to retain because then that means they have to use up less energy to regenerate the heat necessary for their survival in torpor. Did I talk too much right there? Getting on a roll. But anyway, adding more length to it. See, I don't know. I don't understand the adding six to eight inches longer. I don't know how long this hive we're talking about was to begin with, um, but like mine are filling 19 frames. So the Layens hives are 20 frame hives, all 20 hive, all 20 frames of each of my Layens hive has some amount of resource on it, every single frame. So the bees are going to, and this was my concern. I might as well mention this while we're talking about the Layens hive. Uh, my concern was that, wow, they, they filled these frames with honey top to bottom. Aha. But now I notice that the brood is shrinking down on the frames. Looking around for one of those Layens frames I should have here. Anyway, but these deep frames, actually, they're, they're filling in the tops with nothing but honey. And the brood is moving down lower. And it is also concentrated at the first six frames from the entrance. Now, as we can see in that model that I held up, there are three entrances across. I only used the one entrance in the southeast corner of the hive. So all their brood is still concentrated there and they have filled the tops of these frames. So it's kind of looking like a bubble of brood in there and they're filling everything else with honey. So in the winter time, they will of course first migrate up the frames of capped honey. And this is according to Dr. Leo Sharashkin, a millimeter a day. I don't know who looks at them and watches them do that. But so depending on how many millimeters of honey you have above, then that's how many days you have before they're at the top. And that's when they will begin their lateral movement. But if they have enough bees again, remember, and it's warm enough, parts of this mantle will break off and they will be over here collecting resources on those days when it hits 50 or above. And then they'll be migrating back over here with those resources. So it's when the temperatures get cold, stay cold, and it's just as cold inside as it is outside when it comes to the beehive. Um, then that's when they cannot access that feed because they default to protecting the queen and the eggs that she's producing. And of course, the larvae. So I hope that's clear. Question number seven comes from Ian from Old Liverton, Devon, England. Interesting. The only methods I can see to treat my Layens hive for Vivaroa are oxalic acid vaporization or natural methods, such as drone culling and queen caging. Are there alternative methods I can use? 
<sighs> well, see, this is a school of thought. And if you're, if you're reading uh, the book uh, by DeLance, if you want to see the original intent of the way the hive gets used, and if you want to listen to Dr. Leo Sharashkin talk about it, he is treatment free. So the Lance hive is not designed to accommodate any treatment. So he has a live and let live or live and let die practice. So however you take that. For me, this is again where, you know, Dr. Leo, awesome guy. Uh, he lives in uh, the Ozarks of Missouri. I'm from the state of Missouri. And uh, he has his method and he wants it to be hands off as much as possible. That is why when you look at horizontalhive.com and you look at the way the lands is built and designed, it is not set up for any treatment. And that's because he really doesn't want you to do any treatment. He doesn't want you to do any supplemental feeding of any kind. So it's also not set up for that either. Even though they did sell me a frame feeder, I'm not using it. So the frame feeder's out. Um, I won't be putting that in there. And uh, from the look of it, they've stored enough resources on their own to make that happen. So the only treatment, uh, other than the part you already mentioned, if you're going to remove drones, but there again, uh, they don't make really drone comb for that. So you could cut out drone comb, I suppose, if you wanted to. And then uh, the thinking there for those who are listening is that uh, the drones would have more varroa mite reproduction going on during their pupa state than uh, the worker bees because they have a much longer period uh, in pupa. So then the next thing is, uh, so that's IPM, integrated pest management um, and caging the queen, creating a brood break and things like that. But that's part of um, opening an opportunity to treat with oxalic acid vaporization because oxalic acid vaporization is only good for phoretic mites, mites that are exposed. So once they gain access to a pupating worker or a drone, then they're in reproduction and they're protected from the oxalic acid that has to settle on the surfaces that then of course the, the varroa mites walk on and it's, it's speculated upon that the varroa mite, which this is a model of, would get exposure from clambering over the body of bees, nurse bees in this case, or even walking over comb that has this very micro film of uh, oxalic acid on it that they're, if you could see their little feet on the very tips, they have these little translucent lucent pads. And the thinking is that that's where the oxalic acid damages these little pads. And then they lose their ability to grip and stick onto things and hold on. And so I don't know systemically if it gets in and damages the mite. And that's the problem. We know oxalic acid works but what is the method of kill? What is really taking them out because they're not eating it? So anyway, while they're exposed, they get their feet on surfaces that have oxalic acid on it. And then these mites fall off and die because they can't climb, they can't grip, and therefore they can't feed. So that's why that works. It'd be cool if we could learn more about how oxalic acid works. And so for me, that's enough though. And if I had high numbers of varroa destructor mites in my lands hive, I personally would treat. And uh, there's only one place we can drill a hole. And that's because I use either the ProVap 110 because it has that quarter inch copper tube on it. And I don't have to put that through the entrance. I can actually put that through a hole that's drilled. But the way the lands is built from Dr. Leo is that there's lambs wool everywhere. So if you go to drill a quarter inch hole in that, you're gonna get your drill twist all twisted up in lambs wool. So it doesn't work, but there is a band of wood across the front where all those entrances, there are three entrances that are drilled through it. So in line with those, you can drill your quarter inch hole and deliver your oxalic acid vaporization. And when it goes in, it goes throughout the hive, through all the frames. So it doesn't matter where that gets entered. And the good news is too, that it, that hive has those wheels on it. So when you're doing an oxalic acid treatment, all you have to do is move these wheels to the closed position. And then you drill your little hole, quarter inch hole right here. Put your ProVap 110 in there or your Laura B's, you know, oxalic acid vaporization unit in there. 
and it takes about 25 seconds to deliver that and you're wiping out your mites. So that's the only, probably the only part, and I also differ with, differ from Dr. Leo in that he wants you to look at your hives twice a year, once in spring and once in fall to harvest your honey. So I like to see people look at their hives every between every two to three weeks if you can. That's because if you're queenless, that's your chance to do something about it. If you end up queenless and you're not looking at your hives until the end of the year, you're done. They are finished, kaput. Of course, Dr. Leo may make concessions for that if you look at the hive and things from the outside don't look good. So if you've got problems with that, maybe he does uh, invite you then to do your inspections, but you have to then replace a queen. That's why I have two lands hives now, because if I was queenless and I needed to share resources, I need to pull a frame of eggs from one or the other. I need at least two colonies that are alive to do that. And one of them has to have a queen. Next question. Number eight, Daryl Hamner. You've often mentioned having a nuke as a resource hive, and I think it is a great idea. I've been keeping for six years now and have a good grasp of the basics, but about making resource hives, not so much. I'm not sure what you do with your resource colony when you put the queen in another hive as a replacement. Do you start the replacement by making a split? Do you overwinter it as a nuke or combine with other hives? So here's the thing. I, uh, I winter them as a nucleus. I don't, even if it's a one box nuke, I let it go into winter that way. The surprising aspect of that is that uh, it worked. So here's what I did, and I did make a video. So I'm gonna put a link down here to a video where I was giving a lesson to, his name is Eli from Albuquerque, New Mexico, or Edgewood, New Mexico, near Albuquerque. And he was out here and wanted to make a video with me. And so we did an inspection of a beehive and lo and behold, we find out the hive is queenless. So the hive that was queenless was a 10 frame Langstroth hive, which had a deep and a medium on it. And I'll link the video so you can watch it, but I'll describe the process really quick. <clears throat> so what I did was we need a queen. So I went over to a resource hive, which is in a nucleus. It was two five frame stack, so five over five. Pulled it open, looked for the brood, pulled a couple brood frames, found the queen on it, pulled the brood frame with the queen on it, and uh, another frame of brood, and we made sure to leave that nucleus with a frame of brood with eggs and larvae. So of five frames, they had their honey, and of course they had brood and other resources. So we took two frames with the queen on it, and we put those in hive butler totes. That way we know they're not gonna fly away. So I transfer them into hive butler totes, take those over to the hive that was queenless. We pull two frames near the brood already, pull those two frames out, put the frame with the queen on it and the brood eggs and larvae. And the other frame that we added is fortification. It also has brood and uh, capped brood ready to emerge. And we removed the two frames from that hive put them in the hive butler toad and took those back to the nucleus hive and replaced the frames that we had removed. So we left the nucleus hive with eggs so that they could produce their own queens from those eggs. And they did. And because I brought brood, capped, open larvae, eggs, and a queen to the hive that was queenless, I had no resistance there. They accepted the queen right away. And today that's one of my strongest colonies. So, Excellent, very simple, very easy to do. And then, so now what happens? I have this nucleus hive over here that has five frames still, but it's missing its queen. They will notice that the queen is missing. The pheromone will be absent. They will start looking at the eggs that they have. And as soon as those eggs hatch, so eggs hatch on the third day, and they will pick their own egg. I don't try on the spot queen rearing. I don't try to manipulate which egg they're gonna choose. I let them do it all on their own and it's worked really well. So then they'll build their own emergency cells over those. And then that queen emerges after that from the queen cell. They'll usually make multiples. They'll fly out, get mated, come back. That's why again, we do another inspection down the row and we see what's going on with these nucleus hives. And if I find one nucleus hive 
that does not have a queen, no eggs, no open larvae. Now I go to another resource hive and I pull, I leave their queen in and I just pull a frame of their eggs and I swap frames, put the eggs and brood in there and then I let them have another try at making another queen. So these resource hives, we can play checkers with them, you know, we can go back and forth. Anyone missing a queen, here's some eggs for you. This one has a queen. She's really strong. The hive is overproductive. I'm going to pull the queen. I'm going to put her over here. So that's what resource hives are for. If I have a queen, a colony missing a queen, I go to the resource hive and do it. Now, this time of year, I can't do that. We're out of time. We're in late September now, and it's too late to let them make their own queen. Plus, what else is going on there? They've begun the massacre of the males. So drones are dying everywhere. So the chances of getting them to build a queen cell now and do that on their own, slim to none. But that's how I use them, and I'm going to give you a link to that video so you can watch it because I'm teaching him. So maybe some of your questions get answered there. Very, very convenient, very easy to keep colonies queen right when you have resource hives. So that's it for today. We're in the fluff section now. So this would have been question number nine, but uh, instead it's, it's more of a comment. And so what I want to say is someone sent me pictures of the long Langstroth hive based on our prints. Ross Miller uh, did the prints, drew them out himself. So for those of you who um, hate Ikea, for example, like you, you get some Ikea furniture and you're so mad at the way that the instructions are and you broke up your relationship and you know, your fish tank fell apart on the hive stand that, you know, the hive stand that you put it on, Ross uh, does technical illustration for um, Ikea. It's one of his jobs. But anyway, he does the prints and the prints are on my website, thewaytobe.org or fredsfinefowl.com, same site, different names. So anyway, the shout out actually is more of a thank you to Jeff Beardsley. He built one of those based on those prints for Beginner, which is someone who frequently comments and watches my videos. So she had Jeff Beardsley build her horizontal hive and it's the long length. So now on that page, there are pictures that you get to see. So the shout out today is really for you to go to my website and look at what a great job they did on their hive because I put the pictures there. And he said, hey, Fred, where's the gallery where I can see other pictures of people that have built the hives based on your prints and drawings? Well, there, there isn't one because they're the first ones to send them to me. So if you have followed those prints and they're free, by the way, there's Langstroth, practices and all the extras that we were talking about earlier. There's a print for that. And they're in PDF form, so you can download them and you can print them and you can work from them in your wood shop or give them to somebody who's handy if you want somebody to build it. And it has in it all of the features that I have found that work really well in beekeeping and are in concert with honeybee biology. So if you like them, let us know. But anyways, that's a shout out to take to that page and to thank uh, Jeff Beardsley and uh, let's see, there are some updated plans too. So if you have looked at the plans in the past or printed them out, please revisit that because Ross has added some details that weren't there before. Another thing I want to talk to you about today, given the time of year that we're in, this is September the 16th. The clock is running out on summer, unless you're in the Southern Hemisphere. For those of you down in Australia, yay you, you get warm weather ahead. But uh, this is your last chance to fix queenless colonies. So you really, please, should go out and do a detailed observation of your landing boards. If you notice that uh, there's a lot of pollen coming in, and for me there is, at every hive, the pollen is just like a steady stream. And then the contrast is very conspicuous. Then you go to your next colony and there's maybe one to three loads of pollen every minute. And then on the colony before that, you've got 20 loads of pollen per minute. That colony, I'm going to 99.9% .9 guarantee when they have low pollen coming in like that, they are currently queenless. So now what are you going to do to salvage that colony that is really reduced in its landing board activity? You have to do an inspection because we have to look for brood issues and problems like that. It's a great time to also do a mite check. 
Mice can contribute to the decline of the colony, but they're not likely the reason that you're queenless. What might have happened is you had a swarm occur that you didn't catch, you didn't know about it, which they can do it, they're very sneaky. And then you find out there's no queen in there. Well now, as I described, the drones are done. So you have a choice. You can take that colony of bees and you can create a large colony. So now you would amend that colony to another existing colony not your strongest colony, but one that is queen right, that's doing pretty well. Maybe you've got one over there that's in a single deep. And uh, you can put this one on top of that one. And you can combine them. And those bees then will be salvaged. Another thing you can do is there are companies that still sell mated queens this time of year. So you can order in a mated queen. You would have to do that right away. Because, again, once the mated queen gets in there, we're you know probably 25 days out from seeing adult bees coming from that queen. So you could do that, or the other end of it is you can do nothing. Those bees will just live out their lives. You might come out with a laying worker after three or four weeks, and even several laying workers, then that colony would just start generating drones at the end of the year when nobody wants to feed them and there's no queens flying. So they would just live out their lives and, and die. It's not necessarily cruel that you leave them queenless. I'm just saying these are three options. Combine them with another colony, give them a mated queen, let them live out their lives, but they won't be reproducing other than to make drones, potentially. Next thing I wanna say, please reduce all entrances. Please have robbing screens available in the event that your bees start to get robbed. Prevention is a pound of cure, as they say, and having small entrances, even though it seems counterintuitive because there's so much activity and they're venting so hard, at the very minimum, you could put screens, aluminum screens or stainless steel screens that cover the entrance of your hive so they can still pass air through it, but the actual physical passage area shouldn't be more than three inches wide and three eighths of an inch tall. Because we're about to go into winter, what's gonna try to get into your hives? Mice. So here we have deer mice, meadow mice, kangaroo mice, house mice, and none of them can get through the 3 8 inch opening, regardless of its width. So, because they like to move in where it's gonna be warm and the nights start getting colder. And I know that they're already on the go because I have cameras, motion activated cameras inside all of my outbuildings and the deer mice are starting to set up shop in there and uh, I'm collecting them. So, also do your mite assessments. Some people ask this question too, and I think it's kind of funny when, when somebody says this. Is it too late to treat for mites? Well, what are your options? So if you've done a mite count because you finally had the time to do it, I know things get busy. The time to deal with mites is well before now, but something is better than nothing. And if you've not done mite treatments and you do a mite count right now, and people love to send me pictures of their mite counts. I've got pictures of mite counts with easily 60 plus Varroa destructor mites in a 300B mite wash. If you do not treat those bees, they're absolutely doomed. They are going to be diseased because don't forget the mites themselves aren't what destroy your bees. It's the diseases they vector. So they produce and carry, they don't produce, let me change that. They bring disease with them and they inject that into your bees because they're feeding on the fat bodies of your bees. And which bees are they feeding on? The nurse bees, the most critical bees that are responsible for feeding our developing larvae. So they're actually attacking at the very core of the reproduction and maintenance of your hive. So yes, treat them if you have them. It's not too late. And the beauty of oxalic acid vaporization, by the way, you can do it with honey supers on, there's no evidence so far that they produce resistance in mites. And um, you don't have to pull your hive apart if you're using something like a ProVap. So ProVap or the Laura Bees vaporizer, it's about half the cost of the ProVap if you wanna use that. And uh, the thing is, you only have to drill a quarter inch hole in the back of your hive. So you don't even have to be in the front. You put a cotton cloth over the entrance of your hive you introduce your ProVap in the back through the quarter inch hole 
and you've done a treatment in 20 to 30 seconds. And then you leave it closed up for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, you pull that cloth off. And then you put, a, some people use a golf tee in that hole to keep the bees from probabilizing that up. I use quarter 20 threaded screws in there, but it's never too late. I mean, what's your, what are your options? You just left a mite farm right in your apiary. If you have those kinds of numbers of mites, bee drift is a big deal. And when they start to destroy that colony, those mites can clamor onto the bodies of other bees. Those bees can show up at other hives and be welcomed in. And they might have mites on them, and it doesn't take a lot of mites before those mites now start getting into your developing larvae as well. As soon as they enter the pupa state, mites are in. So there's a lot going on. It's never too late. You have to deal with your mites if you have them. If, especially on those numbers, that is a, you can start a domino effect of bees that otherwise would handle themselves with their current mite loads because they have genetic adaptations that help them, this excessive grooming that they do, these varroa sensitive uh, bees that chew off cappings of pupae that have mites in them and it dries out the mite and then they recap it later. They have all of these activities that help mitigate the numbers of mites that are inside the hive, but you get neighbors that move in over here that have these giant mite loads. That's been studied to see how, how that progresses through an apiary and how an otherwise strong, healthy apiary can be destroyed by a single mite farm. Yeah, so you have to do something. Something is better than nothing, and, and it's there are always better times to do it, but it's never too late. If you discover it, you really should do everything you can to try to take care of it. Uh, also, some of you will be pulling off your honey supers and stuff right now, so you have some options of what to do with those. Most people pull off their honey supers when the nectar flows over, but guess what's at a peak right then also? Robbing. So I'm going to bring up another product again. Uh, the Hive Butlers. These are Hive Butler totes that are designed. They hold 10 deep frames and they have enough space underneath of them. So if you even had queen cells and stuff underneath or if you had some, you know, drone comb or something underneath, you can leave that on and put them right in there. The other thing is they're, they've got spacers built into them for your frames. When you put your frames in there, if you've got irregular comb on the front of it and stuff, they won't rub against each other. So the good news is about them, number one, they're easy to clean out, but the other part is when you're at your hives, and this is why those who are doing what I do and not using queen excluders, you go frame by frame to look at your capped honey to see if there's any brood in it. And if there is, that stays with the hive. If there's no brood on it, it's nothing but honeycomb with honey and it's capped or 90% or 80% capped, you pull that frame, shake the bees off of it, put it in your hive butler tote, put the lid on the tote. Bees can't get in there. They can't get back on your frames. Super handy. So then the cleanup comes. So you go and you extract your frames and some people go and put them right back on their hive and let the bees clean them up over a 24 or 48 hour period. You can do that. And it's, it's good to put them right back on the same hive they came off of and let them clean that up. But you know, those are going into winter storage anyway. So what you just did is you put a hive box on there that has a lot of surface area that's nothing but wet honey right now. So that smell is in the air. And so this is a judgment call on the part of the backyard beekeeper. How intense is the potential robbing in my own apiary? If you have one beehive and it's in the middle of a field somewhere, it's in your backyard, and there's no other beekeepers right next to you, you could probably get away with a lot more. But this is when other beehives are in close proximity. They smell the honey when you break open those cells or when you open those frames that have been extracted and that honey draws bees immediately. They smell way better than we do and they're gonna locate it because they're intense right now to get every last ounce of sugar into their hives, winter's coming. So an option is to take those frames and again, I'll mention Hive Butler totes. I'm not trying to market those to you. I'm describing that because ever since I've started using them, and I had friends that were using Hive Butler totes years before I was. I don't know why I was so late to the party on that, because it's also how I store frames that are not in use. I don't leave them in the boxes, in the standard Langstroth boxes. I leave them in Hive Butler totes after extraction. And so I can put those in and take them out to a feeding station. 
And all I do is I tip the high butler tote on its side and it still leaves an angle. I take the cover off and I put that there and it's at chest height on a bench. And I set that up as a robbing station hundreds of feet away from my apiary. The bees smell it. And this year, the good news is uh, I'm watching where the bees are going that are at this robbing station and they're going to and coming from my own apiary. Finally, they're not flying through the woods to the northeast and I'm not feeding somebody else's bees. If they are, the numbers are so low, doesn't matter. So what this does is draws off the foragers to my feeding station. They're doing the service I need them to do. They're cleaning up all these hives, all these frames for winter with drawn comb, great resource for spring. And they're staying in the hive butler totes. So once they're done cleaning them all up, I just put the lids on and now they go into storage and I start stacking them up. Empty frames, cleaned up by bees, and the high butler totes are plastic, so I can hose them out afterwards. So there's going to be, because it's like a robbing, there's going to be bits and pieces of honeycomb and, and uh, propolis and everything else because they're very messy when they clean up a frame like that. And also it's going to be wasps, honeybees, bumblebees, everything that's out flying that, that eats nectar is going to be there, not robbing your apiary. So, and that's just, that's what I do. You can do what you want, but it prevents you from having to put those boxes back on the hive, opening the hive that you took the honey from and having them clean it up. But each time you open that hive, you open that hive up to robbing because it gets the interest of other foragers in the area. They put a lot of pressure on the entrance of that hive as well. So much easier once you've taken it off to have a feeding station somewhere. And if it's going to your bees, um, is pretty good anyway. It's going to your hives somewhere right there. So you are reclaiming it. And the wasps and hornets and honeybees don't fight. They don't. I know somebody commented that bees will bite each other for no reason right at a feeding station, but you don't see a bunch of dead bees laying around from those fights. So if they're biting them, those are those angsty guard bees that I mentioned earlier. They're just kind of born that way. They, they wake up every day angry and uh, they just go after everybody. So anyway, these are end of the year cautionary things. The other thing is these late season inspections too, because when we pull apart frames, when we pull the lid off, they've often built comb and it's got capped honey in the cells that's built right up against the underside of your inner cover. So when you pry that off, there's exposed honey right there on the backs of the frames. And that gets the attention of other bees. So. We take a note from the University of Guelph, which has a fantastic YouTube channel, by the way, if you want to check them out. But they use this canvas again. They'll lay it over the tops of the frames and then they just peel back the frame of interest. So as you start to do your inspections of the frames, you keep it covered. And guess what else it does? It calms your bees. So it keeps that, that honey that you just tore apart from being exposed to everything. The uh, foragers that are in the area don't get to sneak in the back door and scoot down the inner cover or the inner side wall of that uh, beehive while you're trying to take a look over here at the brood and uh, keeps your bees calmer. So, And that stuff, I buy it by the roll. It's cotton duck canvas, it's called. And uh, if you buy artist supply, rolls of unprimed, unsized, it's called. It's just straight cotton. It's a thick canvas. Uh, works really well. So you can use that to keep your stuff covered. And I think that's about everything I have for today. So I'm glad that you spent your time with me today. And I uh, hope you learned something. If you have questions of your own and you want to know where to post those, you can go to thewaytobe.org. Click on the page that's identified as The Way to Be. And there's a form right in the middle of that that you can fill out. You can submit your own question for consideration. We don't answer all questions if they've been answered before many times, uh, if it's not pertinent to the time of year or um, stuff like that. So not every question gets answered, but I do read them all. And if it's something that I think the broader group of listeners would be interested in or would benefit others, and uh, thank you for submitting it. Thanks for being here today. And I hope that your weekend is fantastic. Get out there and inspect your landing boards, close down your entrances, and get ready for winter. Thanks for watching.